Before we begin, three messages. So, you've taken some of the advice that has come from Untether.tv guests, built an app, and now you're turning your attention to generating some hard-earned revenue. Then you should be looking at Pontiflex app leads. Some of your peers who are using app leads are earning CPMs 100 times the industry average. And if you need any other reasons to start, I'll give you two more. You can run sign-up ads from top brands, the ones that you recognize, and it won't take your precious users out of your app. Go to appleads.com, that's A-P-P-L-E-A-D-S.com to sign up. When my company needed to develop a key mobile product, one that I was counting on as a new source of revenue, I knew exactly who to turn to. Macadamian. They delivered on time, with incredible attention to detail, and I was able to get product into customers' hands faster than I ever thought possible. I've personally known them for 10 years, and they do make great products even better. Check them out at www.macadamian.com. What mobile platform do companies like eBay, NBC Universal, The Los Angeles Times, Razorfish, and PayPal use to build their cross-platform native applications? Titanium by Accelerator. They aren't alone. There are now over 25,000 apps deployed by Accelerator, which has been called the Rosetta Stone of app development. And you can start now for free. Just go to www.accelerator.com for more information. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Untether.tv. This is that place you come to for casual conversations with mobile rock stars. And in this case, how about mobile rock stars that feed other mobile rock stars, that fund other mobile rock stars, or the idea and create mobile rock stars? And that's why we're here today. Um, it's a really interesting concept. Uh, we're seeing more and more of these uh, niche uh, venture capitalists or investors that are that are putting money into a subsector or the economy of technology. And this time it happens to be, of course, mobile, because that's what we bring you here. Uh, this is a company called, or a, um, an investment company in an incubator called uh, Tandem Entrepreneurs, and they're, uh, it's an interesting story, and, and we'll get into this because they've been around for a little, little longer than the, um, um, you know, than this new fund, uh, three or four years uh, they've been funded or around, and uh, they've just made a transition into the mobile space where this fund that they're raising is actually going to go into completely into mobile companies. And I'm here joined by uh, Doug uh, Renert, who is the uh, co-founder and uh, partner of the comp of, uh, of Tandem, to help explain what's going on. So, Doug, thank you. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, talking to us about what you're doing with Tandem. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Rob. It's, it's great to have a platform to talk to entrepreneurs. We're we're basically here, as you said, to help the rock stars out there. So the more rock stars we can spread the word to, the better. Well, you know, I read the announcement. I think it was in July that you guys were uh, changing the focus of, uh, from what you were doing or actually focusing on mobile. I don't think it's a change of focus. It's still, you've been doing this for it's a for narrowing first. of the focus, I would say. Exactly. So so I, I can give you a little bit of the history there. Please. And, and I think yeah. it'll get us into context and then we can kind of go crazy from there and, and stick on the mobile <laughs> on the mobile topic. So yeah, we started uh, Tandem about four years ago and the whole notion behind it was that we could back a small number of disruptive startups and you know make a big difference in their success. Um, we, we actually call it muscle capital. Um, we, we came up with that term ourselves. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how how much it takes root, but the, the idea behind it is um, by investing, you know, a lot of your kind of your own time and, and sweat and muscle into companies, and and combining that with you know substantial uh, capital or funding investments, you can make a big impact on the success of those companies. Uh, it means that you can only do so many. Uh, so we we don't really get a whole lot of diversification, um, but. Kind of our philosophy is if we're backing the right teams and kind of investing, you know, 100% of everything we have in those teams, then we don't need diversification. Uh, and in fact, if you believe in something, in something so strongly and, and in its success, you, diversification can be a bad thing, right? right. So, so that's really the, the notion behind Tandem. And we have been doing it for four years. We backed a, you know, a whole slew of companies that we can get into, some of which, and in fact, some of the, the best of those companies, uh, the best of the group were in the mobile space, um, but as we were kind of starting the next version of Tandem, which we're just kind of getting out of the gates on now, um, 
we basically decided to go all into mobile. Uh, and we can get into that, but that, that's really the, the change. <laughs> we, we, you know, we, before, we would do kind of a broad set of Internet and mobile companies. Now we're doing exclusively mobile. We also have built up the, the fund and, and the team to a level where we can do more companies. So that's a great thing as well. We can help more of these rock star entrepreneurs. Um, so we're basically backing about eight uh, teams each year. And uh, we're getting off into the races right now, which is exciting. Well, I, I do want to uh, touch on a little bit more about uh, about Tandem itself before we kind of dive into the meat of this, which will be how you guys out there apply to become uh, a Tandem uh, company. Uh -huh. the, the question I have is is, is really around, um, I read this great article, we were talking about this before we started recording, uh, on all things D, calling you the anti-Y Combinator. Um, uh, so I, I'd like you to kind of uh, d describe, you, you've gone into it, Y Combinator is broad and uh, and thin on the funding and you guys go uh, narrow and a little bit deeper on the funding. Is, is that the only difference between the two of you guys? Well, I mean, that's certainly a, a big difference is just, you know, it's not just how many companies are backed and how much money that goes in, but it's it's what happens as a result of that. And I, you know, neither model is bad. And in fact, uh, you know, we love Y Combinator, and we've backed quite a few teams out of Y Combinator. And in some, in a lot of ways, we're complementary. But it, it is a totally different approach. Um, it, you know, you could almost look at it as the difference between, say, like the Juilliard School and I don't know, pick a, a large university, Penn State. Yeah, yeah. a great, a great school, but you know, a, a pretty large one, which does all sorts of things. And you know, if you're a, if you're a, um, you know, an amazing dancer and you're trying to just, you know, and you want to yes, I am. Do that. Have you seen some of the videos? <laughs> <You are. laughs> no, not at all. My wife would agree with that. Yeah, or a, you know, piano player or whatever. You know, you, and that's what you want to do for your career. Yep. You know, the Juilliard School is probably a pretty, pretty damn good place to go because you know there's all sorts of people who that you know that's all they do and that's all they've ever done and they're going to help you, you know. Get as good as you can be in that in that role. You know, you go you go to Penn State. You may turn out to be a great dancer, but it's probably going to you know you're competing <laughs> with a lot of other people in a lot of different areas, and you know not everybody that uh, you're working with is necessarily going to be as focused on your area as, as you are. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's kind of a similar situation as we we have here, and that we're only doing. We usually do, you know, just a handful of companies at a time. Now they're all focused on mobile, and um, you know they get our basically all of our attention. Um, and they can, you know, and, and in working with each other, they're all kind of, you know, working in the same area as well. So that that builds a lot of synergies. And then on the funding side, you know, we have a considerable amount of funds, and because we're doing just a handful of companies, you know, that those funds get more concentrated <laughs> across that smaller group right. and therefore we can kind of, you know, back those teams with that much more capital. So, uh, you know, it's not that any, it's not that either model is bad. In fact, uh, you know, both models can be great. They're just different and I think, you know, different types of people with different goals can be attracted to each one. Uh, I mean, well said. I love the uh, Juilliard versus uh, Penn State um <clears throat> because I think that that's we're seeing much more of this uh, uh, around. I mean, niche venture funds that are going to go after a specific su subsegment, and even when you when you talk about the technology subsection, and you put mobile in in that as a as a niche, it's still a very broad play these days because uh, mobile can you know encapsulate everything from location searches uh, all the way to uh, cars and you know on deck uh, instrumentation in cars to you know things on the space shuttle right so these are mobile uh, is absolutely. very broad I mean I, I actually have, I, I'm referring to the mobile space as the golden haystack which I kind, of, I kind of stole from Warren Buffett and some other people but the reason I like that term is I mean we are, you know most people don't want to narrow themselves that way or, or kind of write off certain spaces because they want to make sure they can invest in that next golden needle that they happen to come across <laughs> and if you know if they've said they're only doing one area and that you know golden needle comes across in, in a different area that well you know that that's pretty uh, that's not very helpful to them but for us I mean mobile is literally a golden haystack there's so many 
golden needles there that you know it's 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 by far a large enough pool from us to, to draw from and we can only do a few at a time so um, you know we, we don't feel like we're restricting ourselves at all and the more we do focus in one area the better we get um, and it, it just makes a lot of sense although I, I can't claim that we were smart enough to you know just figure this out right away we did have to go through four years of doing all sorts of companies and, and you know really as we were doing this next fund we were talking to enough people and it you know kept turning out that as we talked about what we were excited about and you know the companies that we had backed already that had become really successful we just kept coming back to mobile 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 every time and you know several people asked us well, well why the hell are you doing anything other than mobile right. and that caused us to scratch our heads and say yeah you're right and so um, you know along the way of kind of starting tandem or you know forming tandem 2.0 uh, you know we got hit over the head with a hammer and figured out that was absolutely the right thing to do is it, and I think that that's what happened with the mobile industry is that it, it, it um, it's not like the web was 10 years ago or 11 years ago or 12 years ago because um, the web didn't creep up I mean it, it uh, we watched this tidal wave coming and uh, there was a lot of cajoling and convincing people to buy online or participate online or uh, you know what it meant even to do banking online. Remember those days. Um, and but what happened was that with mobile, it it just it happened. And uh, you know you you looked up one day and there were five billion connected devices out there in, in smartphones and uh, and uh, feature phones and tablets and all these other things. And all of a sudden, the mobile industry was here. And uh, and it happened with such a subtlety. Um, and now it's about a scramble to... Yeah, it, it happened very fast, too. I mean, yeah. faster than, I think, any other kind of Anybody. technology revolution yeah. we've ever seen. And, yeah, talking about that golden haystack, there's this... I refer to it as the golden haystack chart. I didn't come up with it. It was actually, I think, originally created by Mary Meeker, this, uh, you know, well-known Morgan Stanley tech analyst. And she, she shows kind of a, you know, a hockey stick type... Uh, line and it starts out with like a mainframe PC back in you know however many decades ago and then kind of brings us through the evolution of technology and as you said how many people and endpoints are really out there with you know access to whatever that technology gives them and even the internet you know that brought online hundreds of millions of people which was amazing at the time but as you said the the mobile uh, revolution has brought on billions of people and part of it is you know certainly the developing countries that have kind of leapfrogged all the other technology and just gone straight to mobile and in fact kind of surpassed what we even do and right. in the US in terms of what they use mobile for, for and bandwidth and so forth but um, uh, uh, it also has to do with the ages that are attracted to this I think it, it you know my kids, you know, my nephews are even younger, I mean, three, four, five-year-olds all the way up. And then even, you know, the, the older generations, I was in an, uh, an Apple store probably 10 days ago, Rick bumped into somebody I, I hadn't seen in a while, you know, but knew very well, and she introduced me to her mom, and her mom was, I think, 83 years old or something like that, and, and I thought she, her mom was just kind of tagging along on errands, but no, it was, they were actually there for the mom. It was the third time she had visited the Apple store to look at the iPad, and she, I'm not going to buy it today, but I'm getting really close, and <laughs> I said, oh, great, well, you know, what, what did you use before? Oh, I've never used anything. You know, this is going to be my, wow. my first device, and it just shows you that, you know, you, you take, basically, if you go three years old to... You know, the end, years old. and then you multiply that by the rest of the world and you know the developing countries. It truly is just this, a type of opportunity we've never seen and a size of market we've never seen before. And then these, the other thing that makes this, I mean, so so size of market and size of opportunity is obviously one of the things that gets us really excited about this space. But if it were only available to kind of the current giants of the industry. That wouldn't do us that much good because we're inc we're an incubator, right? And we're kind of helping the the upstarts, the, the you know the people that want to disrupt everything. But the beauty of this of this kind of mobile revolution is that it's it's almost completely democratized as well. Um, you know things like the app stores and so forth they didn't exist just a few years ago either. But now 
And, and the other the other part of it is the platforms that are available to developers. Um, yeah, there obviously there's kind of Amazon with their web services and so forth, but. I mean, there's a platform in just about everything right now, and multiple platforms, analytics, payments, geolocation and maps, I mean, you name it. So if you come up with an interesting idea, you literally, with one, two, three people, can build and deliver some pretty amazing stuff in a, in a very short amount of time. Absolutely. You can get it in the hands of hundreds of thousands and many times millions of users very quickly, and then you can let them kind of you know, give you the feedback on what you should be doing. So the fact that, you know, such a small team or, uh, can have that kind of impact is also something I think we've, we've really never seen before. And, and it's changed, by the way, since we started Tandem four years ago. When we started Tandem four years ago, you know, mobile was interesting, but honestly, and, and Amazon was there with web services, which made it great for us because we, we did have this notion that small teams could do things. But the distribution channels were not yet there. We were kind of counting on search engine optimization and the blogosphere and you know those types of things to get the word out and you know get the products into the hands of users. But now, you know, in just a few years, that the whole distribution side of the equation has completely transformed, and you really can build enormous businesses with you know enormous user base with an enormous with enormous amounts of users in a very short period of time. So, you know, that has us that much more fired up about Tandem 2.0. Well, you know, it's really interesting because, you, I mean, you hit on something that, um, I, I mean, you're right in the middle of it. Um, uh, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you're investing in companies and they're coming to you and you get to see some, some pretty amazing ideas uh, and some pretty terrible ideas, I'd assume, that there's a good balance of the, of the good and the bad. Um, and uh, the ambitious and the uh, and the standard, I would say, not good and bad. Um, <laughs> you you must look at this and say, uh, um, you know, there's two things that I want to ask you about around this. Is that first is, is this are, are you seeing a uh, is there a feel of a bubble, right? Where a lot of people have talked about this, and um, you know, I coach companies and I I work with companies in the mobile space, and they come to me and they say, you know what? We we uh, we don't know how much money to take when it comes to investment, and and my advice to them right now in these days and this time is, uh, if the terms are favorable, which they seem to be everywhere right now, um, take as much as you can on those favorable terms because there might not be another favorable time to bring in that investment. Uh, as long as you're not giving up uh, an insane amount of uh, control in the company and you're comfortable with that. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of that taking, right? Uh, Forty million, fifty million dollar f uh, investments in color and uh, Flipboard, and a lot of these companies that you wonder. I mean, Angry Birds and Rovio. Uh, are are we see are these corner cases, or are are you getting the sense that we're we're sitting here uh, in a precarious spot where, uh, whether or not we're in a in a bubble, the media are pushing us into a bubble. Right. Well. I think we're there, valuations are definitely very frothy. Um, as you said, I think that's more, that should be more of a concern for investors than it is for entrepreneurs. Right. So the entrepreneurs should take advantage of you know this time by all means. Um, you know, and, and we and other investors just have to be careful that we don't you know get too carried away and and, and do things that we regret. Right, yep. but. But that being said, I think this is very different than you know the clear bubble we were in yes. a little over ten years ago. Because there, you know, you, the, the companies that were getting these ridiculous valuations and you know even going public and, you know, and and going up to ridiculous market caps from there, you know, a lot of them it was hard to point to what their their business was, and you know, you looked at the fundamentals of where they were going, and it just wasn't clear, and it truly was kind of a, a tulip bull situation. I mean, now we have these frothy and in some cases, I think, unrealistic valuations. But at least when you go back to the fundamentals, you know, why are these companies growing? What are their revenue models? At least the ones that are, you know, most of the ones that are, that are getting those valuations have a very, you know, strong fundamental business model. And, you know, there's kind of rational reasons why people are excited about them. Now, should that always justify the valuations they're getting? Perhaps not. But I guess I, I don't feel like I did, uh, you know, 11, 12 years ago when things were getting completely carried away and 
and uh, it was hard to see, you know, what what kind of foundation was supporting any of that. Now, at least, I see like a, you know an amazing foundation, as I said, of you know, the number of people with devices, the the ability they have to pay for what they want, kind of you know instantly. Yeah. Um, the way that certain spaces are getting transformed. You mentioned Flipboard. You know, they, they've transformed the way people consume content on. Uh, on a tablet, and yeah. there's all sorts of other examples. I don't necessarily want to get into them all because we're, you know, we're going after some of those. But uh, there really are entire markets that are going to get transformed in the next few years, and and that is why I think you see so much excitement, and that's why that you know a lot of this frothiness is there. I mean, interestingly, as we're having this conversation, there's qu you know quite a bit of a, a market correction going on at the, you know the broader public market level. And I honestly, I'm, I'm seeing none of that, you know, down at the three-foot level where I sit. And in fact, times have never been better. I actually heard somebody yesterday I was talking to refer to the private tech sector as the new gold of the uh, market in the sense that it's so much more, ironically, so much more stable than, you know, some of the other stuff out there that traditionally has been the, you know, the stable places to turn to. So, um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot of justification for the excitement, but that being said, yeah, valuations are certain, certainly getting frothy at the same time. Well, I, I mean, when you guys look at, uh, I mean, you, I think you hit it right on there, is that I've, I've never seen this. And, and uh, I mean, both of us, uh, I, I, I lived through the, uh, the web days, the, the great web days. Um, and boy, was it ever a lot of fun. And, and I start to see that kind of... Um, um, controlled fun we'll say I mean as you said mobile is not something that is uh, is is looking for a market um, mobile is exi in existence and it is transforming things it is knocking complete industries on their asses like uh, you know photographs and camera companies are getting decimated by this stuff and there's a polarization between the casual user using an iPhone and the expert user like the real photographers using their uh, advanced equipment, and there's a big gap in there which is being filled by uh, by smartphones. So you start to see that kind of impact on the industry, and when you see that kind of stuff, you know that this is not going away. But then I, I see something like uh, an announcement from uh, Instagram. It's a perfect example of a company that I love. I love this little tool, Instagram's uh, tool. Yeah. But they announce things like 7 million users and 150 million photo uploads and no business model. And then I start to cringe. I say like, oh, you know, who cares? That's a lot of people, but it's now at the point where you're hoarding those people. you got to turn around and somehow uh, uh, generate uh, some kind of revenue from them so you can sustain your business. And with that numbers, you don't need 7 million people to start to make a, to, to make a living off of them. Um, Am I off on this? Do you think, or is it is it a combination of that? Is there a race for users, um, which is reminiscent of the race for eyeballs, uh, or is this something that inherently you can turn into revenue much faster than the web? Um, I mean, I think I think it is a little bit of both, uh, but I think the harder problem to tackle is user traction. So, and, and you know, these businesses. Don't necessarily have big technology barriers. It's it, the right. barriers are more first mover advantage. Yep. So it's to, you know when you look at Facebook as the obvious example, you know which has now been documented in, in the in the great movie, and and the, you know even there there was this classic tension between the co-founders around you know do we do we milk this thing for money or do we just kind of keep cranking the the, the user ha uh, handle here. And, and you know, I think they made the right call. <laughs> uh, In hindsight, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yep. Um, but but I you know I, I think that lesson applies to you know many many other businesses and many businesses in the mobile industry. Now there are exceptions where you know there's really complex technology which creates enough of a barrier that you don't have to necessarily worry about that. But most of these players, I mean, it really is a first mover advantage issue, and and the products they've built could be relatively easily copied and and so forth so I think you know they're trying to build up their walls of defense and get to the point where they you know they have the the network effect in that community that you know it's going to be really tough for anybody else to to crack yeah. and then as you say I mean monetization is not trivial um, but uh, you know most people leave it for kind of the second problem they're going to solve and I think that's the reason why now we go in typically having several ideas with the co-founders around how we're going to crack the user traction issue 
and then several more ideas around how we're going to crack the monetization right. issue. Uh, but, but you know, we also think it's okay to you know try those sequentially a little bit um, because if you tr if you turn on the monetization too quickly, you it can users. put a significant drag on on the former, right? So. Right. So, you know, I, I actually agree with the way the Instagram guys are doing it. Um, I, I think they have several theses on how they're going to make money. And, and uh, you know, my guess is some of those will actually turn out to, to work pretty well. Uh, but, you know, there, there will be other businesses and, uh, you know, without a doubt that, that do, and the jury's still out on some pretty popular ones, you know, that do get a big user base, uh, but, you know, as they try these monetization mechanisms, they, they may not work out as, as well as they had hoped. Well, yeah, I, I, and I think we're, we're going to start to see that, but as long as there's a, as long as there's an attempt, there's an idea behind this, right? Exactly. Where, where you have to turn this in, because even with, like, there's never been a, a better time in the world right now to, to take a product and reach thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of people, uh, you know, exactly. you talked to a developer 10 years ago, and the hope was, you know, if I, if I build a software product and I get it into a thousand people's hands, that's a huge success for us, right? Um, but now we're talking, I talk to entrepreneurs, and they're like, yeah, we only had 100,000 downloads. I'm like, well, 100,000? Like, would you ever, ever considered the fact that you could have reached 100,000 people around the world from your basement? And they say, you know, in that uh, context, no, I, I don't think so. But then it's a challenge to turn that into revenue. And I think that's the that's the next uh, piece to this uh, piece to this puzzle. No, absolutely. And some will get there and some won't. Yeah. You know, when we back companies, and I know you're going to get into this. We can yeah. perhaps start kind of Good transition, transition right now. Yeah. 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 When, when we look at teams, um, we don't necessarily require them to have all that figured out, let alone proven. Um, but as I said, we want, you know, theses, and usually it's more than one because oftentimes the first uh, attempt doesn't work. You know, as I said, both in terms of how we're going to get traction and how we're going to monetize. Um, you know, and, and I think we're pretty good at evaluating uh, the likelihood of those working. Um, but at the same time, we always think, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, so it's it's much better to have you know several ideas in each of those areas. Um, what we really like to see proven actually is that the team can just build amazing product because that seems to be the table stakes, honestly, to you know solving either of those other problems. If you can if you can build a great product, then you have a shot at getting a lot of people to use it, and you know then making money somehow. If you can't even get out of the gates with a great product, uh, you know you're not getting it. You're not even starting the race in a sense. So that's what we're really looking for is the quality of the team, and then we look at you know what they've built as evidence of that. And it doesn't even have to be the the product that the the new business is going to be. A, you know is going to is going to be the uh, disruptor in the new business. It can be stuff they've built in the past mm -hmm. that we can, we can just observe and say, wow, these guys really do get it. They they can build kick ass products and services that people love um, and now they're going to do it in this other area and that's that's close enough that you know we're going they're, they're going to be able to get it done there and then we'll we're you know very comfortable betting on us and them figuring out those other two equations how, you know how are we going to get massive user traction and then how are we going to you know turn that into you know large large amounts of revenue uh, that's that's really what we're looking for, and as I said, we can only do you know make a few bets at a time. So so we're just trying to find the people that kind of fit that criteria the best. I and I mean what you've just described is is that muscle capital piece, right? Which is that um, you guys uh, are very active in the companies that you bring in and incubate. Um, I mean, is that's your full time job, isn't it, to work with these guys? Rather, and do you, first of all, is that your full time job to work with these companies that you bring in? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, spend you know, 150 percent of our time on, on you know, supporting these companies and getting them to to where they need to be. Now, we're also happy to bring in you know other capital whenever it makes sense. So we're not kind of. Uh, we're not hoarding these companies to ourselves, but right. you know, especially during the first part of the journey, they're working out of our offices. Um, they're uh, 
they're um, you know we're basically working day to day with them. There's no uh, there's no mm, board meetings. Those are yeah. those are more superfluous because we're you know we're literally kind of cranking on the business every day with the companies. Okay. They get to a point, hopefully. I mean, almost all of them do where they are starting to get traction, and other people are. You know, with with even more money, or that much more excited about them, and so at that point, we're happy to bring in other investors, and you know, oftentimes they they quickly go out and get their own offices, and you know, grow their teams and so forth. But uh, especially in the early days, you know, we're we're completely hands on on these things, and that's that's really what we spend all of our time on. Uh, I, you know, I love that concept uh, because, uh, as you said, I mean. Um, uh, I think that why I, why what really resonated about what you guys are doing with tandem is is that kind of hands on approach is that uh, you said it at the very beginning is that uh, you know you um, when you invest your not just money your your mind and your effort and your energies uh, it's very difficult to turn that off um, you know when there's forty companies running through this you can't really have uh, give it uh, the attention that it deserves. Um, and uh, I love the idea of a company coming in with a nascent idea, something that they've got, got a great team, a, a good product, a good opportunity, and you turn that into a great product with a great opportunity. And I think that that's, that's what the muscle capital does. Uh, you know, or you might actually pivot the company if necessary, but at least you, you, you're embedded enough to know that this is something that uh, um, you understand the business model and the, and the uh, intricacies of the business, and you understand the personalities of the founders as well, which is something that's great. Um, I love that. Exactly. And, and that's, the, that's another thing we look for and, and that we ask the founders to look for. Is there that kind of personality fit? I mean, yeah. are, are we going to love working together? Um, because we literally are. You know, it, We look at it as if we're joining a company, and we ask them to look at it as if they're hiring us, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and... and uh, but you're paying them to work for them. Yeah, that's that's a great deal, right? Uh, you're paying them to work for them. I love it. Um, yeah, exactly. So about the about uh, this new fund. Uh, so what you call Tandem Two Dot Is there a specific like in the mobile space? Um, do you how do you decide what you're looking for when you're uh, when these applications come? Because I know there's a September first deadline for the applications for this uh, for this new fund. Um, you know. What is it that tweaks you um, about the business model or the type of business that they're in, and and how do you decide who's going to be uh, selected? Uh, what companies are going to uh, you're going to fund? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. It, it turns into a tough decision because we can only do, you know, just just a few at a time. Yep. Um, but you know, as I said, we're looking primarily at the team uh, more than anything else and you know a lot of that honestly is kind of you're voting with your gut and your heart you know are, are, as I said are these are these folks that you want to work with every day for you know at least a, a period of time and, and vice versa but you know it also has to be the potential for a truly kind of disruptive business right. uh, you know that, that can that can be you know a game changer in its own right so we don't know that in these early days by any means and we don't require them to prove it but we have to have kind of the conviction that you know, this thing could be a game changer. It could become a household name. And, and we want to see that same conviction and kind of passion on their side. I mean, you also mentioned earlier that, that these things can pivot. I mean, they absolutely can. We're not the ones who decide that. I mean, you know, we don't want control of the company. We, we just want to help and you know, provide some influence. But uh, it's, it's the founders that have to make those decisions. But we do like flexibility and kind of you know adaptiveness in these founders, and we look for that as well. Um, in the early days, you just don't know enough about exactly what's going to work and and you know what users are going to gravitate towards. So you know the ability to kind of iterate quickly, follow what people's reaction is very closely, and, and, and you know kind of follow that path that that all that information leads you on is is very important to us. So most of that journey has not happened yet when we come in, but we look for kind of the personality um, that will allow that to happen in right. a sense. So that kind of flexibility and adaptiveness is, is really key to us. And those, I mean, those are really the things we look for, um, but by no means is it like a pure science. A, a lot of it is art, and as I said, you know, in addition to looking at how big is this market that they're going after and how ripe for disruption is it. and 
what kind of waves and coattails can we ride to get, you know, somewhat of an unfair distribution advantage. I mean, we're looking at all that stuff, but at the same time, there is kind of a, you know, more of this kind of decision with the gut and the heart at the, at the same time. So Startup voodoo, I would say, is that... Uh, yeah. Because you, you start to see this uh, quite a bit, right, where... Um, there's waves of technology that comes in and co goes out. So, you know, uh, hits the shore and then recedes a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how. I don't know what explain, how to explain it. But, uh, you know, around South by Southwest, there was this, uh, you know, I, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, everybody came out with a, uh, um, you know, like a Yobongo-like uh, group uh, chat. Um, oh, uh, absolutely. Software. We've seen about four of those come through the door here. <laughs> but, but isn't that amazing that it just... It, I mean, that was the first wave. I mean, the leaders descended, you know, uh, uh, almost at the same time. So they've, they've been working on it, you know, for six or seven or eight months leading up to that point. And, and it's like, it strikes me like lightning that, you know, there's nine different companies across the U.S. that have the same idea, re relatively the same idea at the same time, and then kind of go forward. And they all launch at almost the same time as well. Um, how, how you, you hit the nail on the head there. And that, that's that's why to us... The specific idea is not all that important okay. um, because there's a bunch. There's, there are usually a bunch of people hovering around the same area, and as I said before, you know the the barriers to entry are so low anyway. <laughs> if, if if you start doing well, people will see it and they'll they'll follow you pretty, you know, quickly. pretty quickly. So it is all about how are you going to execute in that area and how are you going to kind of evolve the original idea. Um, more quickly and more effectively than kind of everybody else who's hovering around that same general space. And, and that all comes down to, you know, how, how good is the team and, and how good kind of collaboratively can we make that happen. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I never assume any of our companies are going to be kind of be out there on their own. And in some ways you don't want them to be. That, that, that's almost a bad sign, right, that you're, 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 uh, you're at. No one else finds that space interesting enough to, <laughs> to go after well, you know, I've seen lots of companies like that. Um, you know, what about um, things like, you know, when, when you are, uh, you're looking at a company and, uh, you know, the technology is in play, um, you, do they come to you with a, beyond a baked idea? Like, what resonates more, like um, an idea or an actual product that they've got, that they've got a, you know, an alpha or something like that? Oh, yeah, no, we, we very much would prefer to see something working yeah. again it doesn't have to have absolute traction but it's for us it's just evidence that the team can get stuff done and and we can we can also evaluate you know the work product in a sense how well is it designed and you know all that sort of stuff how, how easy is it to use etc um so so we you know most of the teams we backed have built something and, and in most of the cases it's it's out there and people are using it but at the same time, it doesn't have massive traction. So, you know, we're coming in saying, like, wow, this thing has huge potential, but there's still some stuff that has to be done. And we're going to help, you know, with, with those things that have to be done. And, and that's going to make the difference, hopefully, between, you know, great traction and, and the lack thereof. Um, so, but, but at the same time, I would say I wouldn't write, write off some, a team that comes in and you know has an idea and has kind of mapped it out and even you know they can they can show you what it's going to look like and it's more slideware and so forth as long as that team has done something else that we can evaluate so so you know if we can kind of gain confidence that this these are great people based on something they've done in the past and then we can kind of see the vision for the next thing together and they've you know mapped that out clearly enough that's something we'll we'll still consider um, because it it checks those boxes, right? It, it shows that wow, this this team is very capable. They're great entrepreneurs. They're you know they understand you know product very well, yeah. and you know the opportunity is is large, and you know the the market we're going after is is ripe for disruption. If we can check those boxes, you know we're we're good to go. Um, sometimes we check the boxes based on the current product they've built, and sometimes we we check it based on stuff they've done, you know, in in their uh, in in earlier gigs, in a sense. Um, I mean, is there a, are you guys looking for um, 
companies that are building product for other companies like you know there's a lot of companies out there that are building games for example so they're building you know they have five or six or eight of their own games their own ip out there um so they're building multiple products uh, or are you guys looking for single product companies uh you know that are like the instagrams uh, type of company where it's they're building a product and they're they want to amplify that product it doesn't matter to you guys no, it's it's really the latter in terms of what we're going to do together. I think, again, it goes back to, are we doing something that could be, you know, enormously disruptive and end up as a as a great business in and of itself? And it's not that studios, you know, or development shops are bad businesses. They 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 can be nice uh, <laughs> businesses for the people who start them. Um, but they're typically you, you typically don't end up with you know, a great business on your, you know, a, a very large business on your hands. So right. I'm fine with backing people who have done that in the past. And again, that can be evidence of how great they are. Hey, I built, you know, X, Y, and Z for these folks and, you know, look at those great products. But the next idea that we're going to be back, that we're going to back has to be something that they're building for themselves. That, you know, we've got to have that IP. Yeah. It's got to be something that has, you know, enormous potential in and of itself. And we see a good number of those, actually. I, I'm glad you mentioned, mentioned it. I didn't think of it. But we see a lot of groups or teams that have been kind of acting as outsourcers, and they've made other people rich. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think they turn around and they go, what the hell are, what do, are we doing? You know, we're giving all this great IP to you know, these, these other folks. And you know, in fact, I think that's somewhat the story even behind Rovio, which yeah. you mentioned earlier. They had built a bunch of games for other people. And... They said, you know, screw this. <laughs> Let's try this ourselves. <laughs> We're going to build our own. <laughs> yeah, lo and behold, you know, Angry Birds came out and the rest is history there. But, yeah, I mean, we do see a good number of those folks. But, again, the, their next idea has to be something that they want to own and that we think together can be big. What, okay, la last last in-depth question here before we actually get to the uh, how, how do they get more information about this. What about we? You talked about this at the very beginning. Uh, this this seems to be a utopian space, a u utopian technology world in mobile, where everybody's API is open. They've opened up the Komodo. They've just basically said, "Here's all the data you can ever have." Right? There's uh, location data, as you said. There's photo data from guys like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter data, and and everybody's got their open API, so that uh, you know to to lend a helping hand. Now there's even back in there's a back office or. Um, uh, technology infrastructure that's uh, with an open API. It, it just seems like y you can do whatever you want. Yeah. But it's somebody else's data ultimately, right? It could be your idea, but it's somebody else's data. Um, does that play in, in what you look at or does it, do you, do you care? As long as it's the idea, uh, you'll get the data from somewhere. But if, if somebody's built like a postogram on, on top of Instagram's um, and Facebook's uh, photo um, API, does that worry you at all, or does that, you know, do you care about that kind of stuff right off, right, right at the front? No, I think that that's an important factor. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that being said, it doesn't mean you can't leverage other people's platforms and data. I think there's lots of ways to do that. In fact, many of our companies have gotten their traction by riding Facebook in one way or another, yeah. using Facebook Connect to allow easy sign up and to spread the word to friends and so forth. But I, I think, you, you know, you bring up an important point. At some point in the process, you have to start generating your own value and, and you have to kind of start generating your own data. Um, and, and if all you are, are a f is a feature that uh, you know, people like to use, but, but, you know, the true value is sitting somewhere else, uh, you know, that, then it's not like it's, a total dead end business, but it's certainly going to, you know, end up hitting a ceiling at some point. So that is something that's important to think about. Um, but it doesn't mean you you can't or you shouldn't leverage these platforms and leverage other uh, other people's data. I think I think that can be hugely powerful and uh, can be a great way to kind of you know build the business and and the and the user base in the first instance. But you know, like we talked about before, you have to have some theses on where it's going to go. I think you have to have a, a thesis <laughs> or two around what you're going to do over and above, you know, whatever platforms you're, you're writing and how that's going to generate something of value in and of itself. Um, you know, we have 
just to give you an example, we have this great company called Playhaven, which uh, we've been working with for a couple of years now, and they've had they had their own somewhat circuitous path in the beginning, but now they're a game developer platform, and they allow game developers to focus on building great games while they provide kind of real-time marketing and monetization. So game developers can just flip a switch and um, monetize their games in different ways and flip a switch and market to new games to their users or virtual goods to their users. Uh, and, and they don't have to have whole teams <laughs> you know, spending right. time right. figuring out how to do that. Um, but I guess what I was going to say is they, they are now creating an enormous amount of valuable data even though they're a platform that rides on top of iOS, you know, iPhones and iPads and Android and so forth. They they now have all this data around what users are doing in the games and you know what they spend money on and they can segment the different users. You know, here you game developer, here are your whales, you know, the people that are that spend x dollars a day on your game and here are the the people who never spend anything, and you should treat those people differently. And here's the ways you can treat them differently. So, so these guys rode other platforms to get to their level. They've got over 700 developers using it now. And um, but you know, they they made sure while they were doing that that they were adding their own layer of data on top of those platforms. Right. So that they they uh, there, there comes a tipping point really where the data that they're leveraging becomes less and less important as the data that they're collecting for themselves or the, the data they're collecting uh, is amplifying uh, their value by uh, by leveraging somebody else's data. So there's that transition, isn't there? Exactly, yeah. And I, I think the difference between, you know, it's not just data either. You know, there, there's other value as well, but, you know, that's the difference between a a great business and you know an okay business right. is are you adding enough value on top of those other platforms that people view you as kind of an end in and of itself and not just you know a nice feature on top of that other that other product or platform so what we see a lot of these days are great great features um, they're still making money but they're features at this point so uh, yeah. um, limited Absolutely. amount of time um, left, and, and I definitely want to get this through. Um, let's talk about how people can uh, participate in this because really you have a September 1st deadline. you got to get in there. We're about three weeks away. you got to get people registered. Um, so how do they do that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I should say it's not like the whole – uh, opportunity is dead after September first. Um, That's it. We, we, this is a this is an ongoing process. So literally every quarter we'll be looking at new companies and backing new companies. Uh, you know, and it, it's it's never going to be kind of too late to 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 uh, you know apply and, and join tandem. Um, but this this particular go around, yes, we're we're kind of. Um, drawing the line at September 1st and then we're going to make the call on investing in you know a few businesses from from the group who have applied during that time frame and it's a pretty simple process I mean we you can go to our website um, tandementrepreneurs.com or tandeme.com we shortened it because entrepreneurs is one of the toughest words to spell out <laughs> pretty much is. but uh, uh, yeah and then we have a you know, a, a application page that pretty clearly, and it's not a huge amount of information. The most important thing I said is just show us the the stuff you've built, <laughs> and, and you know we'll go from there. But uh, you just go to the website, apply by submitting the information we ask for, and then you know we're we're gonna very quickly kind of make our decisions and uh, start working with that that next group of companies following September one, and then we'll start. You know the app, the next application process, and probably around um, uh, December one or something like that. You know, a few months later, we'll you know we'll we'll do it all over again. So, and location that's, does that's it really does it matter where that. these guys are, uh, or you know, do they move to you? You guys incubate them. Exactly. It doesn't really matter where they are today, but but when we get involved, we back them. Uh, we basically ask that they work really closely with us for six months, and that means working out of our space. We just got a, a nice new big Victorian home in downtown Burlingame and kind of north of Silicon Valley here. And uh, we ask that they kind of camp out there with us for you know at least six months. We actually get uh, provide... Two hundred thousand dollars is kind of the kickstart investment. 
Um, we do that through a convertible note, which is, you know, that vehicle is pretty well understood these days. It's yep. kind of a fair way to back early stage startups. Um, yeah, and then at the end of that six months, depending on where they are, we either, you know, they move out and they bring in lots more capital from other people and we can keep investing as well. Or if it turns out we want to kind of, you know, keep working in that hands-on way uh, on both sides, we can kind of, you know, extend our our involvement, increase our investment, and, you know, keep going until that time comes where the traction is, you know, is, is taking off. So that's that's more or less how we... We operate with these teams when they come in, and, and you, you, you know we don't care where they live today as long as they they live are with willing you tomorrow. to hang out for the next six months with us. Yeah, that's very cool. So uh, go to uh, tandementrepreneurs.com. If you can't spell entrepreneurs, you just go to tandem e uh, dot com, uh, and there's uh, an application process. Uh, you know the, the terms are are pretty clear in front of you. Um, you can meet the entrepreneurs, uh, meet the teams, meet some of the companies that they've backed. Uh, it, it's a pretty um, uh, from what I can see, uh, it's a it, it, the equity on this is a is a fair exchange, and uh, and certainly um, living in an old Victorian home, um, and that's what this is. You basically live, eat, sleep there uh, as a development team, not literally, but uh, but, but it's uh, exactly. You know, I, I don't know what we'll do if people start bringing their sleeping bags in, but uh, sometimes yeah, like it's cots not too or far something. Off that. I, you know, it, it's that startup feeling. Is that um, do, you've obviously got to limit it to people who are non-competitive, right? You, you don't bring in two of the same types of companies, and and it's like sink or swim. It's like Shark Week in there. Whoever survives, uh, it's non. Yeah, it's a small enough group. I mean, usually there's kind of four or five teams in, in the in the building that we're kind of actively working with, and we're we're pretty careful not to. That, that, that they're not doing the exact same thing. I mean, sometimes they may be revolving around, you know. A general space together, but usually they'll have kind of very unique businesses in mind, uh, you know, around that space. Well, this is, this is in great. fact, in fact, we think part of the value is that kind of by collaborating, they're you know they're, they're going to get a lot of uh, advantages, and, and not just with the current companies that happen to be in the space at the same time, but with all the alumni as well. I mean, we've had a bunch of companies. Uh, do very well in mobile and otherwise, and you know, now we're doing even more companies. So that that kind of alumni network is going to continue to grow and grow, which is great. I love it. I love it, Doug. You know what? I, I love what you guys are doing. I love the approach, uh, the hands-on uh, on approach. Uh, um, is something that would get me excited uh, simply because um, it's not dumb money. We always heard that saying: you don't want dumb money. What you want <laughs> is is money that follows with the smarts. And I think that uh, you've got the team obviously to be able to do this. Um, and uh, and uh, the methodical approach that you guys are taking, I think it's great. Um, deep dives with the companies. Um, so I'll, I'll look forward to it. And I'll tell you this right now. When you have chosen those companies, when you have uh, brought them in to tandem into this Victorian home and you are working, there, I want to have them on the show. Uh, each and every one of those mobile companies. When you feel they're ready, I'd love to have each one on and... Uh, and we'll see how these things progress because it's uh, it's a great it's a great way to uh, to see the uh, the fruit of the efforts that you guys are putting into it. If you don't mind, no, that's awesome. And thanks for for offering up your platform. And I'm sure they'll they'll love to take advantage of it. And yeah, let's let's keep this dialogue going. And and I can kind of step aside and let the uh, the rock star entrepreneurs do most of the talking from here on out. Well, I, you know what? I really appreciate your time, Doug, uh, for coming on and, and talking about this. Good luck with these guys. September 1st for this cohort. you got to get them in. Uh, applications at uh, tandeme.com or tandementrepreneurs.com. Go and take a look, and hopefully we can uh, we can boost the level. Uh, you have to live in California if you want to do this. Uh, you have to move to California if you want to do this, and I know that kind of sucks, uh, especially as we're gearing into winter up here in the northeast. Um, yeah, crappy weather out here. Yeah, exactly. It's terrible. <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. It gets down to, like, yeah. what? 70 degrees in the winter. Um, yeah. Uh, so go to tandemy.com. Doug, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, and good luck with this. Great great initiative. I can't wait to see the uh, fruits of this. All right, Rob. Thanks a lot. Let's let's keep in close touch. Take we care. Definitely will. Thank you guys for are watching or listening. I know you found some value. Go to tandemy.com and apply for this. And we'll see you next time on untether.tv. Later. <laughs>